Does our high school status mark us for life? A look at popularity and mean girls, ahead on Science Goes to the Movies. I'm Faith Saley. Welcome to Science Goes to the Movies, a look at the stories of science and how they change our culture. And today we're looking at high school popularity films. And to help us sort out our still troubled feelings about this, we are joined by Mitch Prinstein, the John Van Cedars Distinguished Professor of Psychology at UNC and author of the very interesting new book, Popular, Likeability in a Status-Obsessed World. Hello. Thank you for joining us, Mitch. Thanks for having me. And sitting next to Mitch is Broadway composer and lyricist Lawrence O'Keefe, who co-created the Tony-nominated musical Legally Blonde, which also won an Olivier Award in London, yep. right? And Larry, you most recently made a even bigger cult hit out of the 80s movie Heathers by turning it into an off-Broadway musical. Yep. Hello. Well done. Thank you. All right, we're going to start with Mean Girls, of course, written by Tina Fey and starring Lindsay Lohan. Mean Girls, based on Rosalind Wiseman's nonfiction self-help book, Queen Bees and Wannabes, tells the story of Katie Heron, educated in Africa by scientist parents and thrown into the savage world of suburban high school cliques. Watch out, new meat coming through. This map shows the school's central nervous system, the cafeteria. You got your cool Asians, burnouts, jocks, the greatest people you will ever meet and the worst. So you've never been to a real school before? Shut up. Shut up. I didn't say anything. Plastics. Who are the plastics? They're teen royalty. That's Karen Smith. She is one of the dumbest girls you will ever meet. I'm kind of psychic. Really? It's like I have ESPN or something. Gretchen Wieners. She has two Fendi purses and a silver Lexus. And evil takes a human form in Regina George. She knows everything about everyone. That's why her hair is so big. It's full of secrets. We want to invite you to have lunch with us. Regina seems sweet. Get in, loser. We're going shopping. So, Mitch, in your book, you write that over 80% of us have been victimized at some point in childhood? Yeah. There's a lot of research that talks about two different kinds of victimization. There's the kind that's about being hit and kicked and called names. But then there's this other kind, which is kind of like Mean Girls, which is where your social reputation is damaged. And if you put both of those kinds together, about eight out of 10 of us have experienced that at least at some point in our childhoods. But I, I kind of have to ask, like, who's the magical 20%? <laughs> for, for real, like, there are people who escape childhood without ever having any kind of denigration? It's really rare. You know, there are some kids who are the most popular and they're just untouchable. They have the highest level of status and no one dares to insult them or try and give them a bad reputation because they will retaliate and it'll be worse for the person who provoked them. At what age does this begin? So you can be victimized and we can see Mean Girls' behavior at four years old. Your daughter is yeah. four? Yeah, almost five. Almost five. My son is five. This is terrifying. I have a five-year-old too, yeah, and it... What is it about that age? Well, you know, this is the time when they first start to work in like a structured setting, and kids are really responsive to teachers actually, so they pick up on who the teachers prefer, and they tend to elevate those in status, the ones that the teachers like the most, often the ones who are the smartest, and the kids who are the troublemakers tend to get pushed to the outskirts. That's interesting because it makes you think that the, what we used to call a teacher's pet is also the most popular. Whereas you would think that the teacher's pet would be the one that the kids in class are like, ha ha, you know, that you're nerdy, that you're the teacher's pet. I think it flips at a certain age. I remember noticing that getting along with the teachers, <laughs> at, at a young age I noticed that getting along with the teachers suddenly wasn't working for me anymore. <laughs> That's so, exactly right. Yeah. So around the age of 12 or 13, it completely turns. When you're 12 or 13, the most cool thing you can do is to think that your parents are lame and to think that what teachers want you to do is awful. And suddenly it's all about doing what the peers want you to do. So those really high achieving kids go from being the most cool to the biggest geeks right at that transition to adolescence. That's also when a second form of popularity comes on board, which is the kind we think of when we hear the word popular. Which is what? How would you define that? So that kind of popularity or status, it's really 
who's the most visible, who's the most influential, who are the ones that everyone wants to be like, and they actually end up being the most aggressive, believe it or not. This sounds an awful lot like the songs that you write. I just noticed that I've written a lot of musicals, more than 10, and almost all of them deal with outsider, misfit, outcast, and will that person be able to learn to assimilate or will that person be ejected or, or killed? So <laughs> the fact that, that struggles with popularity are so common and ubiquitous, does that, does that make it easier or harder to capture those moments in songs? I would dare say that my experiences have helped. I uh, feel I might be qualified to write Heather's the Musical, which is apparently about the meanest school in America. It was set at Westerberg High in Sherwood, Ohio, which is a fictional place. But Dan Waters, the original screenwriter, had been abused in his school system in Ohio growing up. He had witnessed horrible abuse, and he wrote Heather's kind of as a, a cry of rage and, and indignation. And then he saw it become a massive cult hit, and then uh, the rights got snapped up by friends of mine, and we wrote a musical, and he came to the reading, one of the very first readings we did, and we got along wonderfully because we were comparing notes, and we had very similar childhoods, and at one point he said, okay, we gotta stop, because Larry, uh, I thought I went to the meanest high school in America, but apparently you did, <laughs> and I wrote Heather's. So, yeah, the stories abound, and uh, a very wonderful friend of mine, Jennifer Sr., uh, I went to high school with her, and she then went on. She's a wonderful writer for New York Magazine and New York uh, Yeah, she New wrote Times. All Joy and None of All, the Fun. All Joy and No Fun, yeah. a wonderful book about how hard it is to raise kids. And she uh, wrote an article right around the time of our high school reunion about why you never really leave high school, why high school sort of imprints you permanently with a kind of uh, worldview. And she did point out that a lot of uh, recent findings, a lot of recent studies show that adolescence from age 12 to 18 is the number one time when you need the most number of adults around, when you should have the smallest class size, when you need the most individual attention, and that's when kids usually get the least. That's interesting. Yeah, so, you're, right. you're, you're nodding. That, that is exactly true. Uh, there's, so now we have research that shows how it is that we store the memories that end up playing a role every day as you're an adult, 40, 50 years later, when you see a social scene in front of you. The thing that's activated in your brain that helps you to make sense of what you're seeing in front of you are those memories back from when you're that age. You know, there's some research that shows that when they looked at the relationship between grown men's height and their salary, they found that what was more strongly related uh, was not just that tall men made more money, but it was those who were tall at the age of 15. There was something about their experience <laughs> when they were an adolescent. You know, we, we kind of all feel that way sometimes, like I still feel younger than I really am. I still feel like that version of me when I was 13 is still there. It turns out that's true from a neuroscience perspective. And those who, are, who were really unpopular, you can ask them to watch a scene and they will spend more time, if they're wearing an eye tracker device, staring at the negative cues in that scene. And if you have people who were popular watch the same exact scene, they stare longer at the positive cues. So those mm -hmm. early childhood experiences really are shaping, they're kind of a lens that are shaping the way you look at the world for the rest of your life. It's, there's something so heartbreaking about that. It's like anatomy is destiny. Like the, the poor, you know, the, the boy who shoots up between sophomore and junior year has like a better life forever than the kid who doesn't shoot up until freshman year of college. Well, it can change, <laughs> it can change. You can change that. Mm -hmm. But most of us, we don't really think about how that's still playing a role. We, we like to brush it under the rug and sure. say, oh, you know, I'm so different than back then. It doesn't matter if I was popular. And it, it does. It does because you have, to, you have to realize what your bias is, what kind of filter you're walking around with, and then you can change it. But most of us don't like to acknowledge that there is that version of us that's still affecting how we live. Mitch, in Mean Girls, the movie, the, there are moments when high school is depicted as a savage jungle. Yeah. Is, is popularity an animal instinct? So believe it or not, it is. Um, there's a part of our brains, it's a part that we share with all different mammals. It's the part that's the least human. And it's called the ventral striatum. And it basically is a part that lights up whenever we feel like we're getting attention we're getting praise and we're getting uh, positive feedback from our peers. It could be on social media. So when we see an Instagram post with a lot of likes, it lights up this part of our brains. But also when you're popular. 
And the reason why it's there, people think, is because we really needed to evolutionarily kind of care about whether we were in the group and had protection or whether we were out of the group and might be attacked by a woolly mammoth. So that part of our brains develops really early. In fact, it develops earlier than the other parts of our brains, which is why people get obsessed with popularity right at the puberty transition, 11, 12, 13 years old. And there is something incredibly savage and animalistic about it. We see it in these other animals. So it's really brilliant the way that that's depicted in the, in the movie because that's kind of exactly the way that it works. In, in the movie, the popular girls are called the plastics and they're really quite rotten. <laughs> in real life, are, are mean people popular? Yeah, so the, the best way to get that kind of popularity, that status popularity, is to be aggressive. And when, um, when folks have talked with uh, cheerleaders and other, you know, perhaps mean girls, to find out why they do that, they'll tell you flat out. The reason why they need to be aggressive is that it sets a boundary between their group and all the others. It shows what happens if you try to permeate the plastics. You know, if you, if you dissolve that boundary, they lose their power. They lose their access to resources. They lose their, their standing. So to fiercely defend that line between them and everyone else, they know that it's going to give them a reputation of being stuck up or obnoxious or mean. But they willingly and knowingly do it as a way of making sure that they stay at the top of the heap and everyone else stays lower. I'm dusting off my anthropology degree. You're actually a <laughs> Harvard-trained anthropologist, uh, no, Larry. just a BA. But I had great teachers who, uh, they had a very similar perspective. They saw some of the topics you're talking about from a group perspective. And I had a great professor, Arthur Kleinman, who said, nature and evolution does not care about the individual success or happiness of any member of any population. All that evolution cares about is the survival of a species. And therefore, uh, all these instincts or all of these habits from his perspective was adaptations designed to further the success of a population. And therefore, if you weren't strong enough or cruel enough or aggressive enough to be a plastic, good luck to you. You do not deserve enough resources. You, you will be left behind when the, when the tribe has to migrate across the desert. But what about when you have to write entertaining, hummable songs <laughs> and lines for these type yeah. of characters yeah. to say and sing? How does that translate to the stage? Because, because when you're in the audience, you also kind of you kind of need to root yeah. for someone, even if she's incorrigible. That's very true. That that there's a couple of tricks that writers learn, and I did not invent any of them. Where you steal them from any source you can, including musical theater or literature or whatever. And I steal a ton from Aristotle's Rhetoric whenever I can. But villains don't. Don't say I'm a villain for the most part. They say I am doing what must be done to fix the situation. And often they'll say we're doing what must be done to keep the school happy or to keep the school successful. And the plastics probably don't think of themselves as selfish or, or hurting other people so much as they think of they're doing what must be done to keep the student body To uphold successful. the social order. Right? Absolutely, yes. Um, and there's my uh, Mean Girls has tons of that. Mean Girls musical is going to have wonderful songs. I cannot wait for you to see it. But the best thing a writer can do is see from the individual perspective uh, somebody who doesn't have this group perspective, somebody who's thinking only of themselves. And apparently that's an evolutionary advantage too for selfish people to think only of themselves. <laughs> when I went to go see Heather's, the musical, there was a lot of cheering for the nastiness. <laughs> well, is it cathartic, do you think? Success always looks good. That when somebody sets out to do something and achieves it really well, you have respect for that. I don't know if it, it, there's a scientific or, or neurobiological uh, explanation for it. but Well, I mean, we are programmed to care about those who are popular. We're programmed to look at them more often, to feel like we'll get rewards if we're near them. Mm -hmm. Actually, just feeling like you're around someone that's popular, it lowers your inhibitions. It makes you more interested in feeling connected to them because it's in our, as you're saying, it's in our best interests as a species to care about popularity. You know that there's research now that shows that if you are socially rejected, within 40 minutes, you can see markers in your blood that show you that your DNA has been activated. Um, to do what? <laughs> your, your DNA expresses itself to give you a pro-inflammation response. And the reason why is because if you're not popular, you're probably about to get wounded. 
So your body prepares you, sends you actually, there are signals within an area of the brain that alerts us to pain. It's called social pain. Your brain sends out these powerful signals to say, pay attention more to your popularity, go back into the, into the herd, and your body starts preparing you for the Wounds. expectation of a wound. <laughs> This uh, is so disturbing. I mean, we, we, are, <laughs> we three are so far out of high school, but we all have little kids. Yeah. Like, when I hear this as a parent, my first thought is, what do I do for my kid? If 80% if of kids are going to get wounded, what do we do? So there, there are so many things to do, but I'd say, you know, the first thing is to really remember that there are two very different kinds of popularity. One is the kind that our five-year-olds are experiencing now, which is who is the most likable? Now, likability is a good thing. Likability, those kids who are the most likable, they're not mean at all. They're actually really nice and helpful and making others feel valued and important. That likability will help them, believe it or not, 50 years later, they'll be more likely to get hired, promoted, they'll make more money, they'll be happier, they'll be healthier, they'll have better uh, marriages, and their children will be better adjusted. So we want to promote likability. But you don't want to promote status, which is that mean girl's kind of popularity. Mm -hmm. Status is related to growing up to having relationship problems, being overly focused on your status decades after high school, having addictions, anxiety, and depression. So for five-year-olds and, and parents of young kids, make sure you're guiding your kids towards the right kind of popularity. And that is one that's really about caring about others and making them feel valued. Oh. <laughs> I love that answer. <laughs> um, Larry, I've, I am very happy to say I'm familiar with a lot of your work and can hum a lot of tunes. And a hallmark of your songs is that the characters who sing them are very, um, hi they're hyperverbal and very funny. Is, is that a factor of the fact that, you know, that's, that's what we want to hear in music and lyrics? Or are these popular, if villainous, characters also kind of smart and funny? Producers will often say to a composer and a lyricist uh, things like, don't, don't be too smart. The audience doesn't listen too much to the lyrics. We've heard that. And did they say that to Stephen Sondheim? They probably did early in his career, actually. <laughs> they said too wordy, probably. I'm fairly sure of it. And actually, Sondheim once said that rhymes and intricacy connote education in your character. So if your character rhymes a lot, the audience will conclude that is an educated, thoughtful person. It's probably not a coincidence that the educated, thoughtful, hyperverbal, hyper-expressive ones are not always the ones who were popular because there is such a thing as being a smarty pants or being too, you know, talkative. And that's not always good for popularity. And some of the most uh, hyperverbal characters in Nell's and my work often are the less popular ones. You know, in movies we see pretty girls and athletic boys as the popular ones. Is that, is that changing at all? I mean, you know, earmarks of popularity, c can they be different depending on geography or the goals of your peers? Yeah, so we, we see that cross-culturally there are a couple of things that relate to being high in popularity, especially that status kind of popularity we see in adolescence. Physical attractiveness and athletic ability, particularly here in the West, where we really value athletes, those tend to be really important. Also, being aggressive will make you not likable, but more popular in terms of status. But once you get beyond those universals, it really does depend on the culture that you're growing up in. Um, so in China, we found that being quiet and being a good community member makes you higher in status. Being aggressive makes you lower. And then all across America, you can hear about different cultures. The, the all boys school will say that how much you bench press ends up playing a much bigger role. And the parochial schools will say that, you know, your parents' position in the church or synagogue, you know, plays a big role. And um, within your small local culture, whatever's most valued trickles down to affect what adolescents value too. Larry, do you think that media and songs and Broadway musicals can um, impact our vision of what popularity is? All media can. Um, when you take a P, an idea or a story and you condense it to the level of a three-minute song, that's incredibly powerful. Because if you can pack it in there with a memorable tune, repetitive ideas or rhythms that make it memorable, you can remember and disseminate that message much farther and, and even faster than if you wrote a, you know, an essay or, or an article. So yeah, 
you can use these things. It's the, the, the rules of propaganda do not change, although the, the, <laughs> the media does. In Mean Girls, being with, with the popular girls, the plastics, turns Lindsay Lohan's character from a good kid to a nasty queen <laughs> bee. Mitch, do you think an obsession with popularity or status hampers our ability to tell good from bad? So it actually does in ways that we're only just figuring out based on research using fMRI brain scans. Um, it turns out now that if you show somebody a picture about something that they generally do not value, a really inappropriate behavior or aggress aggression, um, but you show them that picture with a lot of Instagram likes attached to it, it not only rewards that brain center that makes them feel kind of a high from it, but it, it lowers the activity in what's called the prefrontal cortex, which is their inhibition center, the brain's brakes. So in other words, showing somebody something on social media and showing that it's very popular as an idea makes you less averse to it. Um, it makes you, you could Normalization, say- Normalization, as we've been saying it. in politics. Exactly, and, and the political you know, analogy is a really apt one because this is probably the same ideas that were used with fake news and that were used to um, change opinions in our country. Those tactics are being used towards our children right now. <sighs> um, as, as Go home and hug your kids. I know, I know, <laughs> I'm feeling terrified. Um, as some of you may know, approval is kind of my thing. I wrote a book called Approval Junkie. And Mitch, I'm wondering how important is it for, for people to know that someone, or really anyone, likes them, validates them? Yeah, Google did this really cool study where they looked at all the different factors that might make people feel happy and satisfied at work. And um, they found that they could boil everything down to just two factors. One of them had to do with um, getting some really good feedback from their, uh, their peers and supervisors. But the other was having anyone, just someone, like them and approve of them. Um, there's something I about, get it. I'm, yeah. I'm like, there's nothing wrong with it. It's such a fundamental human need, it right? That's what I wrote a about. Human need. Yeah, no, you're, you're completely correct. I mean, all the science really backs that up. And when we don't have that feeling of approval, it leads to all these difficulties decades later even. It's a fundamental human need. But do we find that, um, this is a leading question because I hope I know the way you're going to answer <laughs> it. Do we find that with kids, even if they're not you know, conventionally popular, if a, if a child growing up and going through adolescence feels like there are a few people who really give them approbation, who really hug them tight, feel maybe understood by one best friend and two parents, mm -hmm. can, they, can that kid transcend all the crap that happens in high school? Absolutely. So this is the importance of the two different kinds of popularity because you might be the lowest in status. You might be getting victimized every single day, but if you have one friendship, it seems to buffer all of the negative effects on the rest of your life. So that approval, that close connection and that feeling of likability, that experience of being likable, even just by a couple, um, can make all the difference. And to maximize the likelihood of that, we got some great advice from a kindergarten admissions officer recently who said that her kid had had issues in school and therefore she made sure to have several peer groups she knew friends in school, she knew friends in some of her extracurriculars, things that had nothing to do with school, some other extracurricular thing like camp friends, and she maintained friendships yeah. with all the different groups because she said at some point, every single one of them will let you down or will disintegrate. Yeah. And you will lose these friendships in some terrible, painful way. And that's why it's very important to have your eggs in other baskets as well. Mm -hmm. And then to, you may not have somebody as wonderful as a best friend or a super 100% supportive friend, but at least you, you will increase the likelihood that you'll have someone you can rely on at all times. Let me ask you this. All of these high school popularity movies really focus on young women. Mitch, where do young men come in? So it turns out that there is a big gender difference. Um, for boys, it's possible to be likable and also to be high in status at the same time a little bit more than it is for girls. In fact, for girls, uh. it's a horrible message for young women. It's, I know. This explains the, the, our last election, but go right, ahead. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, but for girls, um, it seems to be the case that if you are high in status, then at least half of the grade hates you. You're not just not highly likable, you are actively despised. And it sends a really horrible message to young women. It kind of says if you want to be really high in status, you're gonna have to give up 
on your likability or vice versa, which is of course not true, but that's been instantiated in high school because that is the way that it seems to work in the vast majority of schools. Let me ask you this, yeah. as a psychologist, as an artist, is popularity a good thing or a bad thing? Depends on which kind. Yeah. Because um, we do know that being likable is something that doesn't just change your life outcomes, it actually leads to feeling much happier. Every time that you are welcomed into a group, every time you're given the opportunity to have more social interaction, especially for kids, it's a teaching moment. It's a time that they learn new skills. And it's not the case that likable kids do really well because of favoritism. They actually have accrued more skills in life because they've been invited into contexts where they have the opportunity to learn more things. Mm. But when it comes to status, and this may ring true in this political kind of climate as well, those who have high status seem to grow up still thinking that status is the way that the world works. They grow up feeling like they have to continually maintain their status, they have to let everyone know how dominant and aggressive they are and how weak everyone else is, and they become the kind of sad status seekers that could never truly be happy because they've placed all of their life's happiness and success in the hands of others thinking of them as being popular. Mitch, I hope that your next book is about uh, high school reunions because, <laughs> because I think the stories change as the years right. go by. So That's right. Thank you both for joining us. That's all we have time for today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For all of you watching, be sure to check out our Science Goes to the Movies Facebook page for web-only clips and keep up with everything related to Science Goes to the Movies all in one place. And if you want to watch past episodes or download our new podcast, check us out at cuny.tv.